If you've ever woken up early in the morning, you may have heard a choir of birds chirping outside your window, singing their hearts out. But what's that all about? Why do birds sing in the morning? Colossal Questions! Bird scientists call that period in the early morning where seemingly every bird within earshot sings the dawn chorus. It starts around 4 a.m. and can last for several hours. Of course, birds sing all throughout the day, but during the dawn chorus, their songs tend to be louder, livelier, and much more frequent. According to experts, birds belt out their songs to attract a mate or warn other birds to steer clear of their territory. Basically like a beautiful sing-song version of You Look Cute or Get Off My Branch. So those songs are less about crooning and much more about showing other birds just how fit and healthy you are. So that's why they sing, but why does it have to be so early in the morning? Well, experts aren't certain, but they do have a few ideas. The traditional theory is that in the darker hours of the early morning, birds can't do any of their other bird chores, like foraging for food. So they use that time to get their singing in instead. Another theory is that birds sing so early because it tends to be extra quiet, allowing their songs to travel further. Without all the hustle and bustle of the daytime, their songs would be easier for a mate to pick out. But both those theories have fallen out of favor in the last few years. Instead, many now believe it's much more about showing off just how fit and healthy they are. You see, birds do most of their feeding during the day. So first thing in the morning tends to be when they're the hungriest and weakest. Being able to belt out a song loud and proud proves to potential mates or threats that they're nice and strong. The louder they sing, the stronger they sound, which helps attract a mate. A nice loud song keeps other birds from trying to move into their territory and can make a tiny bird sound much bigger than they are. So why do birds sing? For the same reason lots of us like to show off, to try and impress each other and seem as cool as they can. <laughs> Pretty relatable. Have you ever looked up at the sky on a beautiful afternoon and wondered to yourself, why is the sky blue? Colossal Questions! If you've ever seen a rainbow in the sky or played with a triangular prism, you probably know that light is actually made up of different colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And that's just the light we can actually see. Most light is actually invisible to us, like ultraviolet light, microwaves, or radio waves, all of which are forms of invisible light that our eyes can't see. Why all the talk of waves? Because light moves as waves that are different lengths. Shorter waves make bluer light, and longer waves make light that's more red. The air that makes up our atmosphere may seem colorless, but it's actually full of countless microscopic nanoparticles, like molecules of nitrogen, which makes up over 70% of the air we breathe. When sunlight passes through those particles floating around in the air, the shorter light waves get scattered, while the longer waves pass right through. Since blue light has shorter waves, the scattered light appears blue. That scattered blue light bounces all around in the air around us and enters our eyes, making the sky look blue. This effect is called Rayleigh scattering, and it's the reason why we see a blue sky even though air doesn't actually have a color. Okay, so that's why the sky's blue, but what about other colors? Why does the sky get pink or red as the sun is rising or setting? When the sun is rising or setting, it sits very low in the sky, which means the sunlight needs to travel through way more atmosphere before it reaches our eyes. When light is traveling through such a thick layer of atmosphere, the blue light tends to be scattered and deflected away in other directions, leaving more red, pink, orange, and yellow light for us to see. But when the sun is directly above Earth, the light doesn't need to travel through nearly as much atmosphere and scatters in all directions, which makes the whole sky appear blue. If we didn't have our atmosphere, 
Not only would it be kind of hard to breathe, but the sun would shine directly down on us, completely unblocked. So if you think it hurts to get a burn on a sunny day at the beach, it actually could be a lot worse. Have you ever stopped and wondered to yourself, why are most plants green? Colossal Questions! In order to understand why most plants are green, we'll first have to learn how we even see color in the first place. You see, every time you look at something, you're not actually seeing the color of the thing itself. Instead, when light shines on an object, it absorbs some colors from the light and reflects others. The colors we see when looking at stuff is actually just the light that different objects are reflecting back into our eyeballs. Trippy, right? So, the reason grass, leaves, and other plants look green is because the plants are absorbing all the other colors and just reflecting the color green back to our eyes. Okay, so that's how we see colors, but why green? Why do most plants only reflect green back at us while absorbing the rest? Well, that has to do with a very special chemical inside plants called chlorophyll, which is what they use to make their food. The chlorophyll inside the leaves traps light from the sun. The plant then uses that stored up light energy to change water and chemicals in the air into sugars and oxygen. The plant eats the sugars and releases the oxygen, which we breathe. This whole process is called photosynthesis, and it's super important. Why? Because without it, plants couldn't eat and we couldn't breathe. And none of that would be possible without chlorophyll, which just so happens to absorb all the reds, blues, and other colors and reflects green light back into your eyes. That's also why some parts of the plant might look more green than others. There's usually a lot more chlorophyll in the leaves than the stem of a plant, which is why the stems aren't usually quite as dark. And not all parts of a leaf always have the same amount of chlorophyll. Some leaves have light green, white, or yellow stripes, or spots on them. There's also some plants that have yellow, red, purple, or orange leaves year round and never look green. Don't worry, those plants get to eat too. They still have plenty of green chlorophyll in them, but those kinds of plants also have lots of other chemicals in their leaves that are other colors, enough to blot out the chlorophyll's green hue. So why are plants green? Because chlorophyll is green and plants are full of it. So whenever you see a nice green plant, you can thank that special green light bouncing chemical, chlorophyll. One of the easiest ways to know it's extra cold outside is whether or not you can see people's breath. So what's the deal? Why can you see your breath when it's cold outside, but not when it's hot? Colossal Questions. Every time you take a breath, you inhale the air around you, then exhale it back out, mainly in the form of a gas called carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide and other gases you breathe out also contain plenty of moisture from your mouth and lungs in the form of water vapor. Water vapor is water in its gas form, and in order for water to stay a gas, it needs lots of energy. Warm air can hold way more water vapor than cold air can. So when it's warmer outside, the gas can more easily move from your warm lungs to your mouth to the air without ever changing from a gas into a liquid. But when it's nice and cold outside, all that water vapor you breathe out loses its energy really fast since the cold air can't support nearly as much water vapor. Instead, the gas packs together and begins to form tiny water or ice droplets that we see as a foggy cloud floating in front of people's faces. The colder it gets, the easier it becomes to see your breath, usually around 40 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. But it's not just temperature that makes your breath visible. The amount of humidity in the air is just as important. For instance, you may be able to see your breath on a really humid day even if it's still warm out. Since humid air already has plenty of water in it, 
the water vapor you breathe out is much more likely to form into droplets. And on the other hand, you may not be able to see your breath even when it's frigid out if the air is extra dry. So, why can we see our breath? Because, well, it turns out sometimes it's cold enough outside that even our breath ends up huddling together for warmth. <laughs> or something like that. Tornadoes are strange, sudden, and can be quite dangerous. But how do they form? What causes a tornado in the first place? Colossal questions. Whether you call them twisters, cyclones, or tornadoes, they're all the same. Giant, powerful, rotating columns of air that emerge out of a thunderstorm and reach down to the ground, spinning and sucking up dust, dirt, and debris as they whirl. But it takes more than just a thunderstorm to make a tornado. A few other things need to happen at the same time to create the perfect storm. First, a thunderstorm needs to start, usually in the spring or summer. Then, there needs to be a sudden change in wind direction and an increase in wind speed that causes the air in the thunderstorm clouds to start swirling faster and faster. Next, rising warm air from the ground literally tips the quick swirling air over. All that spinning forms a funnel that starts to suck up even more warm air from the ground. That funnel of spinning air keeps getting longer and longer while spinning until it finally touches the ground, officially becoming a tornado. Their strength is measured on a scale called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, which are split into six categories, each stronger and more dangerous than the last. An EF0 and 1 tornado are considered fairly weak and likely won't do much damage, if any. EF2 and 3 are strong, with winds well over 100 miles per hour. The two most dangerous types of tornadoes on the scale are EF4 and 5. EF5's, the largest category, is any tornado with winds over 200 miles per hour. Only about 2% of tornadoes ever get this strong. The strongest tornadoes can knock over trees, rip apart roofs, bring down buildings, and even send cars or trucks flying through the air. Tornadoes can form on almost every continent, but about three quarters of them appear over the United States in an area called Tornado Alley that extends from South Dakota all the way down to Texas. The widest tornado ever formed was back in 2013 in El Reno, Oklahoma. That category EF5 tornado had winds over 295 miles per hour and was over two miles long and traveled more than 16 miles in just 40 minutes. Poor Oklahoma can't catch a break because the fastest tornado wind speeds ever recorded were in the Sooner State as well. The Bridge Creek Moor Twister on May 3rd, 1999 had unbelievable wind speeds of 318 miles per hour, the highest ever recorded. So, next time you're in your cellar hiding from a terrible tornado, at least you'll understand how it happened. Not that it'll help. Each year, we hear about another hurricane, cyclone, or typhoon bearing down on a coastal city and battering it with stormy weather strong enough to cause all kinds of damage. But what actually is a hurricane and what causes them? Each year, around 150 hurricanes form all across the globe in the warm ocean waters near the equator. These massive storms are called hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean, Caribbean Sea, Gulf of Mexico, and Eastern Pacific Ocean. But in the Western Pacific, they're known as typhoons. In the Southern Pacific and Indian Oceans, they're called cyclones, and scientists call them all tropical cyclones no matter where they happen. But no matter what you call them, you'll best recognize one by its colossal size, distinctive swirly shape, and big blank spot in the middle known as the eye of the storm. They form over warm tropical ocean water as the warm air floating just above the water rises and is replaced by cooler air higher in the sky. 
Now that it's closer to the warm ocean, the cool air will start to warm up and rise, making a cycle. If this cycle starts to happen fast enough, it can cause huge storm clouds to form. Those massive clouds begin to spin. As the spinning cycle continues to suck up hot air, the spiral gets stronger and the winds get faster. When winds get to 39 miles an hour, the weather system officially becomes known as a tropical storm. These are plenty strong enough to cause damage and flooding. Once the wind speed reaches 75 miles per hour, well, that's when the storm is officially considered a hurricane. Some super strong hurricanes have been known to have winds stronger than 200 miles per hour. And if strong winds weren't dangerous enough, hurricanes also tend to be pretty large, typically around 300 miles across, sometimes up to 600 miles. Not only that, but these storms also move slowly, usually just 10 to 20 miles per hour. That means there's plenty of time for a hurricane to pass overhead, wreaking havoc for upwards of a week at a time. Strong winds and driving rain for miles and miles, all creeping along at a snail's pace. Well, no wonder hurricanes are known for causing so much damage. Most hurricanes build momentum out in the water, but once they hit land, they slowly start to lose strength. Why? Well, without the warm water below to heat up the air, the cycle short circuits and the storm starts to shrink and slow down. Hurricanes might start to die out over land, but it's also when they do the most damage. Storm surges, flooding, downed trees, and flying debris from high-speed winds all make the coast extra dangerous when a hurricane's overhead. So, if you live near a coast that gets hit by hurricanes, cyclones, or typhoons, don't panic. Just make sure to stay prepared, stay safe, and stay alert. Oh, and expect a few things to get wet.